Um, hello. It all started in April last year when June and I set off on a walk. And it was actually a walk instead of a field walk for a change. We'd run out of ploughed fields to, fi to find things in. Um, so we decided we would have a walk up through the Findrick estate because we knew there was a burial cairn and uh, an enclosure up at the top of a hill. Now, I actually, when I first got married, I actually stayed just a stone's throw from the site, but at the time I, I didn't even know it existed because archaeology wasn't of any interest to me then. Um, so we set off and um, we got to the top of the hill and we should have been excited at seeing the burial cairn and the enclosure, but all we could see in front of us was a ploughed field. <laughs> so, um, of course, we knew we couldn't go into the <coughs> field without permission. So reluctantly, we had a walk along a track. I thought, well, we, at least we could have a good view. Um, so I was enjoying the, the lovely view. But what, of course, had June spotted at her feet? Well, when I'm walking, wherever I'm walking these days, my eyes are always on the ground, um, despite the bonny views. Um, so we're walking along this track towards, um, or looking over towards Longfannan and Glenmillan, uh, and there in the middle of the track was a flint. And I think, if I'm right, Rosalind, it was a bonny toffee. Could have been a toffee coloured flint or a reddish one. I can't quite remember now. So, of course, we got uh, extremely excited and uh, we sort of turned back from, the, from the, the track there, came back past the enclosure and down past this sort of cloud corner of a field. And um, the temptation was too much, wasn't it? We, we did well, go over the, over the gate and just had a wee, a wee look along the edge. And, of course, there we could see that there was lithics on, on, on the surface. So uh, we were well trained by Mesolithic Decide to always contact the farmer or the landowner and get permission uh, to walk in the fields. And we've done that with all the fields we've gone to. Um, and normally after uh, we, we've walked the fields, we would ask them if they would like to see what it is we're actually looking for, what we're actually finding on, on their ground. Um, but uh, it's usually the answer is, always the same it's well near really but just, just let me if find you find any gold, any gold. <laughs> <laughs> every time every time um well because the, the flint that we were finding was much different from anything we'd found at uh, mesolithic d side we thought we would go home and put it on the the Mesolithic D side Facebook page and see if any of the experts would maybe come back and could uh, throw some light on this funny sort of white coloured flint. Um, so we got, there was mention of quartzite and chert. So from then on, we just decided to call it chert because, well, basically because we didn't care no any better. <laughs> <laughs> um, so another thing we did find in the field, there's loads of quartz and you can see on the slide there, that's just one of many huge chunks of um, fabulous quartz with lo loads of um, crystal, so, some were like pendants, weren't they, June? So, yes, it, yeah, like col columnar sort of yeah, uh, like formations. So they always they remind were, me of like little grottos. That's right, they were scattered yeah. all over the field. Um, and we just wondered, uh, this is, of course, is me, and I, I always have all these theories about things. Um, we'd heard that um, quartz was of significance to ancient people because around here they've, they've found um, quartz on, um, I think, burial sites and things. Um, if well, there I'm was right, one in particular up, up beside Tarland. Um, Tarland, yeah. Uh, there was one up there with a scatter of um, quartz. So then, June, what happened uh, next? I think you went home and uh, recorded the Well, talk. I think, I think um, once we'd had them onto the Mesolithic page, obviously there was a bit of interest and so on, and uh, Ali suggested that we record the flints. 
Um, and because of my sort of creaky knees and wrists, so arthritis and so on, at, at a, a dig that we'd, we'd done recently up at up beside a boy at Hugh Head, I wasn't able to physically do the digging. Uh, it was just too hard on, on my joints. So I had um, been helping Angela to um, collect and record the finds that, that we were making at the dig. And with that sort of experience uh, and um, the fact that I use Excel at my work as well, uh, Angela sent me a, like a sample template. So we did get the, the finds recorded onto the Excel sheet and we sent that off to Irvin um, to do a plot of, of the finds onto the field. And um, this, this is how it, it, it came back. Um, Irvin did come back to us and say, what about the boundary? There doesn't seem to be a proper boundary to the field. So we explained to him that it was the, like a small corner of a bigger field that had been fenced off um, to plant this game crop uh, for, the, for the shooting, you know, for game cover. Um, and it was actually, or it had originally been part of a much bigger field, um, which at that time was uh, just for grazing. It was under grass for, for cattle grazing on it. That's right. So, of course, we did surmise that maybe in the future the rest would be... Well, but, yes, we, do, we, we did but, sort of think, wow. But um, it was grass, and, I mean, grass can be left for seven, eight years and um, yes, yeah, or a lot that? longer around here sometimes. Mm -hmm. So we just uh, moved on to other things. Um, found, we did find a few more fields to walk round about and we didn't really imagine we would be back there for a very long time. Um, but you can see by the next slide, um, <laughs> we're finding well, it's field FD1A, we've called it. Finding that was just, again, just pure chance. Once again, June and I set off for a walk with no field, no field walking, no ploughed fields around. And uh, why we actually walked up the Tillyhing Farm Road, I'm really not sure. I, I think I think we'd be exhausted all we'd, we'd done all the walks round about home so often we were just like so. where can we go for a change of the little tilly hang I think we, we we caught a glimpse of a there was a track on on a, on a hill and we wondered if we could maybe access it round the back for a new walk or of course mm. flints are always on our mind when we see hills um so we started walking up the track and uh I uh, June, of course, she happened to notice there was some cows up at the top of a, of the field, but my eyes were just drawn across the field, and I couldn't believe that, that it was actually had been ploughed and reseeded in grass. This this is the adjoining part of that the little game. Field. Yeah, the, the the big field area. So I was just absolutely horrified. <laughs> We uh, we couldn't believe that we'd missed it, and there's no way you can see it from the road. So if we hadn't gone up there by pure chance, I I personally think that the flint gods had a hand in us. I, th I think up the so. Road yes. <laughs> um, yeah, we we call on the flint gods quite a lot, so, so I think we they did. were definitely they had played a part that day. But yeah. of course, we couldn't help ourselves again, and we thought we would just have a wee walk along the bottom. But the grass was far too thick and, and we found absolutely nothing but June, of course, not to be deterred. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it, it's it's a very big field and, and sloping away uh, up, up the hill from us. And you could see on, on the, um, the steeper slopes, the grass hadn't grown as well. And, and there was different bare areas of soil. Um, so... Uh, did we, we did we have a wee wander then? Uh, no, well, you went home and you went home and got permission. And that, ah, right. uh, yes, yeah. okay, yes, we're back to that again. Uh, yes, we we sort of scooted back home quickly. It was a lovely day, and we scooted back home, and um, I 
contacted the farmer again and mm -hmm. got his permission. Um, and he he did actually apologise to us um, for not having thought about us um, when, when he had the field cultivated, but he did say it had been done in very quick order and it just never crossed his mind. So uh, we forgave him, didn't we, Rosalind? <laughs> we did, we did, yes. because he's, he's very nice. We've all got our own farmers, you see. We've all got our own little farmers we know. <laughs> <laughs> to um, call upon when we see ploughed fields. <laughs> that's it. So the next day after uh, we'd gotten the permission, we, we went back up and did a scouting walk. I think we just did a, a uh, quick we, up we really the middle of the field, was it? Yeah, we didn't expect to find anything. and we, we didn't even actually tell Carol because we were so sure we wouldn't find anything. Uh -huh. I think we just, we just took a path straight up the middle of the field and we thought, well, at least we could go and see the... The burial cave. Yeah, we could go back yeah. up there again, but, yeah. but I, I don't remember. We obviously we, we started finding flints, um, maybe not in abundance that day, but there were certainly were flints to find. So we that we we headed off back home and uh, phoned Carol um, to see if she was up for some field walking. So silly question. <laughs> um, and it was such a fine day, we, I think we just, we decided we would have a quick supper and we would just head up that evening. So yeah. that, that was the first of it, wasn't it? Yeah, so we, Carol, uh, yes. it's Carol, what did you uh, think when I sent a photograph through to you to say that we'd found a field? You can tell us what you think if Ali moves on to the next slide. Next slide. Well, that still makes me laugh. <laughs> Because Rosalind sent me this photo and said, look what we're finding in a field, you need to come. And I thought, oh, she's having me on again. This is a piece of streaky bacon from my husband's breakfast. He's just having a laugh. <laughs> because that's what Rosalind does. We have some fun. And even in the next slide, you'll see that um, Rosalind sends things to us when she's um, cooking her tea. She'll slice um, things up. There's an example of a neat. She's been napping. Well, uh, you'll be, you'll notice, Carol, that my, my flan is correctly GPS. Yes. And my neep, <laughs> yeah, my neep it, it goes through the full napping process from neep yeah. cobble to a beautiful barbed and tanned arrowhead and a, a lovely blade as well. And I've also sent Rosalind um, a photo of when I've been peeling carrots and I've made a lovely uh, primary core. <laughs> <laughs> so we have some fun like that. And I really thought that that streaky bacon was another joke. But it actually was a fun and we were so excited. <laughs> I was delighted to be actually going out with my colleagues to walking again. Because one of the things we get out of it is not just about finding flints. Um, it's about the social aspect of it, because we have a right good dinner along the way. We've all got families, we've all got aging parents, and we share our troubles, and we put the world to rights. So I was really looking forward to getting back out with them again. Well, it was very, it was very, sorry, sorry. It was very timely, because prior to that, we could only go out as a pair. Yeah, um, it was only two households because of the COVID-19 yeah. restrictions. Yeah. So we hadn't been a threesome for quite some time. So by that time, the, the restrictions had been um, eased. Um, so, of course, that was why we were able to call Carol and the, the Torfins trio was reunited in, in FD1A. So uh, that, but that was exciting. Night. We couldn't even wait for the next day. We had to go back. Then, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, so yes. if you move on to the next slide, Ali. Um, this, this is just um, a couple of photos of, of our curious coos. They, they were the most beautiful heifers in the field, and they used to come down. They, they greeted us every day when we arrived. They rushed down to the bottom of the field uh, to see us. Um, I don't know what they, they thought we were doing. They probably thought we were looking for neeps or something <laughs> like that, but... They were absolutely beautiful and they're all the, the different colours of flint, really. Um, I, I do often wonder if they missed us when we didn't come back. We well, it was such, a, such an isolated field up there as well, you know, so us us arriving every day for, was it four or five days, obviously. I, I, loved sort of... the, I loved the photo. You see the one looking over the white one's back just in case it's missing something. <laughs> something, <yeah. laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, but we had we had to sort of uh, we walked across the bottom of their field, didn't we? The, the path into FD one A has went through another couple of fields, so we we did sort of um, also just check to see that they were up the field a wee bit uh, to, um, but, um, to make, to make a, our way another, through. Another good thing of checking with a farmer, he did say that they were all heifers. Yes, and, yeah. But we would never ever go into fun. a field if it was cows and calves and things like that, but. They were extremely friendly. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah. we should maybe move on to um, move on. That was my point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so from for curious coos to cores. Yeah. Well, the, the very next day that we went back, I had forgot my glasses. I need my um, distance classes. Um, so, before we started, June kindly gave me a pair of our distance classes. And for that minute on, I started finding loads of cores. <laughs> and we were all starting to find a lot. But we had a good laugh about June's, uh, you know, magic specs. Um, but we were on cloud nine. Look at, you can see on the slide, I mean, the selection of things that we were finding uh, was absolutely fantastic. We had such a great day. You were just you like kids in a sticky shop. You had the most fabulous big ones. If you see the, the second slide at the bottom, um, huge finds. They're fantastic. Well, the toffee one in the middle on the bottom line, that was a surprise find because if you remember, that was the day they had been watching a cloud uh, coming across the sky and it was a really heavy rain cloud and we had to stop what we were doing and run for shelter under the trees That's and right, yes. that cloud had moved across uh -huh. so then when we were walking diagonally across the field again to take up our position where we'd left off and along the furrows we found that one the toffee one in the middle and the on the line in the bottom there just lying on top of the dirt but we'd already covered that bit of ground how did we not see that line <laughs> So one of the learning curves for us was occasionally to walk diagonally across the field as well, because <laughs> you might find something else. I think probably because we were in that field, um, you know, with the grass coming through, uh, it was easier for us to, you know, normally we're walking in fields with furrows. You know, you, you tend to, you know, you walk in that, and that's a linear fashion um, along the furrows. But um, I think possibly it did help that the field was, you know, was encropped like that. And really... I think another thing, June, I don't know about you two, but I found that the green grass, it was like a, a contrast in colour instead of just being mm. red. Yep. And the flints just seemed to stand out so, so well. I would never have dreamt that you could find so many flints in a, a field with grass through mm. so far as that i think so, we we're just lucky that it was such a sloping field though so that yeah. the slopes were drier yeah, it, i think it was the... an exceptionally dry spring and mm -hmm. we wouldn't have been so lucky if it had been um, a wet year and the grass had grown quicker mm -hmm. but well, I, I, th I think i think and we were the, very the, lucky that's just a couple of photos I took of our, our best finds. You don't say just, Rosalind. Those are <laughs> fabulous. Just, I mean, look, look, look at the array of colours there and the shapes. I yeah. mean, that that is just, they're, they're just and gorgeous. I mean, we even found a, a complete pebble, so it was, was fantastic, really. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think we would get, we, we wouldn't get more pleasure from finding gold. This to oh, us yeah. is yeah. is our treasure. Right. Yeah. De definitely. That's right. Um, you can move on to the next slide, Ali. Uh, well, this this slide, um, we often some of the flints you find you really see them best when you hold them up to the light, and this one in particular, you can see it must be quite an unusual cobble. It's um, very uh, transparent in certain pieces and when we found compared these two flints i'm nearly sure that that these two must have come from the same cobble uh, i'm yes. just surprising but it, it does look they look so similar and it's such an unusual flint uh, and we have speculated about this before yeah. um, we, we found in you know in adjoining fields we found things and we think 
God, those are so alike. You really think they must have come from the same yeah. source, core, but, uh, cobble, whatever. June, I think you named the one in the, the picture. Yes, well, I, I, <laughs> I found the one in the top picture. And as soon as I picked it up, I thought, well, that looks a bit like a fish. And there's angel fish. So, of course, Rosalind, with her uh, imagination when she was taking the photos, thought, ha ha. And she got her uh, fridge magnets down. <laughs> and and like actually, it's, uh, it's, it's an amazing uh, It is. It's even got yeah. the spots on it. The yes. What yeah. colour is that one in the middle? So it so. would make a lovely fridge magnet. <laughs> uh, okay. The next slide. Oh, yes. Right. This, is, this is Muscovite. Um, so just like um, in FD1, we found uh, loads of quartz and crystals, but in FD1A, there was an area, it was, it was just a certain area at the top of the field, and it had large quantities of this muscovite. Um, it's a common mineral of the mica family, and it can be found in what they call apparently books, uh, because they can be easily split into thin paper sheets. And when you actually hold up one of the, the paper sheets, they're, they're virtually transparent. You can see right through them. But when you see them on the ground like this, although the photo just doesn't do it justice, if you're out in the sunshine, um, it's really shiny. Oh, they're yes. really beautiful. They're and I just thought that my theories as usual that it would have been just as amazing to prehistoric people to have found that uh, in the area as well especially with it being so close to the burial cairn in the mm -hmm. enclosure but uh, well, we have we have found this um in other places but, but in much smaller pieces yeah i think i remember gathering some to give to carol um, to give to her her granddaughter, yeah, but it was just really like almost like thumbnail size and so on. But yeah. these these are much larger these pieces and really caught the eye. Yeah. But of course, we didn't realise what they, what it was then. We you you did the investigation when we came home to find uh, find find out what it was. Apparently, I think in Russia, I think it was Russia. Um, long ago, so, yeah. they actually used muscovite as glass for windows, as a replacement for glass and windows. Glass, so yeah. it must come in huge sheets um, in some areas around the world. Mm -hmm. But I think you're. I think you're right. I, th I think prehistoric people must have been quite fascinated, as we are really, but by quartz. And you know, crystalline formation, things that sparkle and shine, mm -hmm. catch the light like that. It, it must have seemed, I don't mm -hmm. know if magical is the right word, but they, they must they must have been special to them, you would think. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. We'll move on to the next slide. Okay. Yeah. Right, yes. Um this is uh, the the next plotting from Irvin. Um we we obviously recorded uh, all of our finds for FD one A um, as we'd done previously, um, but by this time we we'd gotten a, another um, template from lithic expert Anne Clark. So we were sort of upping our game a wee bit, and you know, in, in the amount of information and description that um, we were putting into our, our records. So we we duly recorded all of the finds, and my husband and I made an attempt at um, using the, the the app. It's a QGIS, Q G I S, um, and we we'd sort of done a, a a rough plotting using just dots. So we could see that there was a definite pattern. You could see. Almost, you know, like these circular shapes um, in the plotting, you know, and we were uh, presuming that maybe they were um, like hut circles or they were sitting in circles, working, you know, napping and what have you. So it was really quite exciting. But anyhow, we sent them off to Irvin to do a, a proper plot. Uh, 
don't tell Eric. Um, <laughs> so this has come back obviously now with all of the, the different symbols for the different um, types of lithics. And um, Irvin's obviously combined, we, we had asked him if he could combine uh, FD1 with FD1A just to give the, the whole picture. Um, so it was really quite spectacular. Yeah. Um, and of course, at the end of July, um, something really exciting happened. Um, we had a, an online tutorial with Anne, um, and she was she was helping us to really explaining how to do the recording and things. Uh, what was it called again? I can't remember the the name of the, the title. No, the title of the descriptions and things. Yeah. Um, so I just happened to mention the chert we'd been finding. I, I asked her that if we, we were to record it as flint or chert or something, and she couldn't really understand what we were speaking about. So I did, I went for a few pieces and held them up, but you can never really see when you're, you're holding something up to the screen. No, so the same. She, um, she said she would take a look at it for us, which was really exciting for us because at least we would be get some sort of name for what it was chert or quartzite or, or mm -hmm. whatever um so uh sorry i've lost my place i'm going to pick up the finds from you rosalyn sorry? Um, i came to take i came to pick up the finds from you and oh, i put them yeah. down well, to Anne. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, this is her having a quick look at them when I was yeah, down there. I'm having a quick look at them there. So um, we just got them back the other week, really. We haven't had them long. Week, so we haven't really had a, a detailed um, look because we really need to get the flints back so that we can compare what they look like to what I'm saying on them. But the, the thing that I found really strange was i mean i was expecting to get so much things wrong on the recording sheet but the thing we got wrong constantly was the color um the, i yeah, the... jokingly i jokingly said what we really need is the the Anne clark equivalent of the the dulux paint chart and i couldn't actually believe this but there is one <laughs> not an Anne clark one but there is an actually a a rock color chart um, so you never know, we might use it, but somehow I think June, um, our, our descriptions are rather artistic, aren't they? And I, I don't think the colour chart will just fit in. With our... <laughs> no, we, we do tend to be a wee bit um, arty, I suppose, about our, our dis colour descriptions, yeah. Uh, well, just, we're going to have to, I think that's one of the things we really need to ask Anne, how she... Mm -hmm decides which colour to put. <laughs> I, th I think each, each each lithic, when you're sitting looking at it and, and for recording it, you really get to know each lithic intimately is maybe maybe a bit yeah. too strong a word, but you, you really get to see them and using the spotlight and the magnifying glass and each one is quite individual. And well, I, I see all these nuances in the, in the color, you know, from white to cream to yeah. honey to, to toffee to red, light brown, dark brown, you know, and there's this huge <laughs> range. But uh, anyhow, that's just artistic license, I suppose. Well, I'll have to sort of draw in my horns and be a little bit more specific. Maybe. Yeah. Right. So if we give you a, a few details about Anne's report. So here's Anne's report. Um, the total was 188 lithics found. Uh, there was a mix of brown and grey flint, um, from, all from pebble sources. And uh, also um, the, the news that we'd been waiting for as well was uh, what, what was this so-called chert that, uh, that we, we'd sort of uh, ident or identified. Um, and Anne has, uh, in fact, described it as a, a light grey mottled flint with a translucency quite unlike the local bottom gravel flint. Uh, the smooth cortex on two scrapers made from this material show that the pebbles were rolled 
in a high energy environment and likely to be from a beach source. Um, it was tricky to identify all of the pieces of this flint since light grey flint was common overall, but 39 pieces were grouped separately. There were 17 cores, um, more than we did identified, and then she went on to tell us about the different tools. But there was one blade of note, um, the large mottled grey flint um, that I'd found uh, was told to be, in fact, a large crested blade. Um, that's the first one on the slide. And it was measured at 63 millimetres long. Um, its dating was uncertain, but it was possibly dated to the later up, uh, upper Paleolithic, when the production of large blades was uh, normal then. It's interesting that the tools made from the light mottled grey flint, our so-called chert, the scrapers, uh, the knife and the serrated blade are the most distinctive forms and were made during the late Neolithic. Uh, so in summary, uh, she says that the lithic assemblage provides an interesting snapshot into the long duration of prehistoric occupation of this area. First, uh, the large crested blade, which might date to the final Upper Paleolithic. Uh, evidence for late Mesolithic flint working is provided by single platform cores, as well as some narrower blades. However, late Neolithic flint working is most frequent, uh, with evidence for bipolar working large scrapers and a retouched knife. It is interesting that this light mottled grey beach pebble flint was sought out by the late Neolithic inhabitants to flake into tools. So June, what you're really saying is we've found a palimpsest. Yes, it's one indeed. of my favourite <laughs> archaeological words. I just had to get it in. Um, just a, a palimpsest of the everyday tools and debitage, yet another favourite that I suppose was just left over the millennia in that field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just the la layers of activity. Yeah. She um, Sheila, Sheila will be pleased with you that you Sheila managed will be to get pleased. that I into the talk. Sheila will be pleased. I just popped in and I had to get debitage, but we're not mentioning the theodolite, Sheila. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't come um, into it. Anne has actually suggested that we plot the, lith the lithics again maybe using the two different materials so that we can compare the, the concentrations to see if we could maybe deduce if they were like done in one at one time or if it's maybe just been over a, a, a few a few years or if it was just like one event when somebody maybe sat there and napped. So that's something we will try and do again, won't we, June? Yes, well, we, we did sort of make a start on it, but we, we're, it's, it's a work in progress at the moment. A work in progress, and we'll try, and we'll probably have to get Eric to help us. Yes. <laughs> oh, we, could, so we could send it to Eric then, hopefully. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, we don't often look up when we're concentrating on things to the ground. But <laughs> That's true, Carol. We did, at one occasion, we did see a cloud formation in the shape of a nine, and that just had to be taken a photograph of because we had such a laugh about that. We'd been talking about being in cloud nine with the finds that we were having, the quantity and the quality. Um, yeah. but that really just summed it up. It was. And uh, I've just got one so last bit of information for you. <clears throat> the, reason the, the reason we the field was named FD1A was because, as Arvin had pointed out to us, it was part of one big field which was attached to FD1. Um, and we had named it because we had just come on it by chance and, and thought it belonged to the Findrick estate. So we called FD1 and we thought, well, we can't not change the name. Change yeah. the name. And they had to go together. So we just thought, well, we'll call it FD1A. But actually, it really should have been named after the farm, which is called Tilly Hen. Um, we'd recently, uh, we'd all bought copies, actually, of a, a book written by two local people, Dennis, Christie and Brian Murray. It was titled A History of Turfins. 
and was a really interesting read, but it was an appendix at the back of the book about the origins and meanings of local place names that really grabbed our attention. They referred to two works exploring place names. The first was initiated by James MacDonald, whose book Place Names of West Aberdeenshire was published in 1897 and updated by William Alexander in 1952. Both were Gaelic scholars. The second was Celtic Place Names in Aberdeenshire, written by John Milne in 1912. Although MacDonald and Milne both had their work published, apparently neither acknowledged the existence of the other. And I think to this day, the Gaelic um, academic community have a very low opinion of Milne's work. So um, Alexander and MacDonald, they described Tilly Heng now, you'll have to excuse my pronunciation. I'm not a Gaelic speaker. As Talich Shan, and that means old knoll, which in, in its own, I suppose, well, we're, we're thinking it is a, a, a very old, a hill that's maybe been visited by over the centuries. But it was Milne's description that really caught our attention. He called it Talichonye. And apparently that means the hill of assembly. So I can remember the excitement when we first read know. that. It, it just seems yeah. so pertinent, doesn't it? So, Carol. Yeah. So has this hill with the enclosure in the cairn always been an important meeting place throughout history? I guess we'll never know for sure, but Anne's report certainly shows that there's been human presence there, possibly. Um, from as far back as late Upper Paleolithic, right through to late Neolithic. And we think there's clear evidence of settlements on this site. What do you think? I think so. I, I think so, yes. De definitely, definitely. Those circles are quite clear, I think. Yeah. But anyhow, um, we're now... Uh, waiting with bated breath for the, the flints to come back to us, the actual physical uh, flints, um, and we'll get our report um, tidied up and, and completed. Um, and we will be obviously have to submit the results to uh, Aberdeenshire Council Archaeology, Archaeology Department and also to Treasure Trove. Um, as is required. So it will be quite interesting and, and exciting for it to, to be out there and sort of recorded in the professional sort of archaeology sort of field or something for, for people to sort of pick up on or, you know, study. I don't know. But anyhow, we would like to thank uh, Anne uh, very much indeed for, for taking on and um, looking at, at, at our flints and doing the report for us is uh, very much appreciated and for Ali um, for all this for helping us uh, so get this all sorted out and um, perhaps one day there might be a dig arranged I don't know time who will knows? tell who knows mm -hmm. and of course if anyone um, has any more theories we'd be, light, be delighted to hear them um, we'll love a good theory so <laughs> Thank you all for listening. Thank you.